So as I'm sure you know, forelimb lameness is an extremely common problem in dogs. I do think though it's really greatly underdiagnosed, sometimes incorrectly diagnosed. And so that's something we want to focus on is how to approach the examination, hopefully diagnosing these dogs earlier in the course so that we have more treatment options available. We're going to really focus on the elbow today. We'll talk about the forelimb exam. I do really want to accentuate the point though that every time we have to do a complete examination and not only the forelimbs of course but the overall examination of the dog and we really need to think about other things that can occur besides just the elbows. Hey Dustin, I'm Jimmy Cook. I'm the veterinarian hey, here. Nice to meet you. And this is Calla? This is Calla. All right. And Calla is uh, two and a half years old? Two and a half. Okay, perfect. Just going to examine her. Hey Calla, what's going on? So any problems you notice or concerns? Uh, no, actually, she's been pretty good. We, uh, she's a family dog about okay. 10 months of the year, and then we kind of hunt her and train with okay. her a couple of months of the year. Cool. So the goal is to kind of keep her on those activity levels, so some performance, and then be in the household pet as well, too. Exactly. Perfect. All right. We're just going to do an elbow exam today. Okay. So if you don't mind, I'll have you take off her um, harness. And if you can just kind of keep her attention, I'll kind of examine her from the back. Okay. Hey, Calla. All right. So I do like to do the exam um, with the dog standing. I think it keeps them most natural. We can kind of see different problems that way, how they're shifting their weight. And then also like in the, the client can help me in terms of noticing any problems. You know, is that pain? Is that just her nervousness or those types of things? We're just going to focus on the forelimbs today because we're interested in the elbow part of it. But I think this is a great way to approach this. And even when they're not having problems, like Dustin said, um, it's a great time for screening um, to make sure there's nothing impending. So once we would do the rest of the exam, then we're going to focus in on the front limbs here. And the reason I like, again, to have them standing is we can really look at symmetry. So every time we do something on the left leg, we want to look at that same thing on the right leg. One thing that we just start with is just her positioning. So you can see she's standing very square. Um, you know, she'll shift her weight normally, no problems with that. So then I like to start at the bottom and work my way up. And I'm just going to look at the paws first. So I do support them, kind of gives them comfort um, and keeps them under control at the same time. Um, although that's not a problem with Cala. So the first thing I want to do is look at the paws and pads. Especially, you know, this dog does some work, um, some performance, so that can be a big problem um, that we want to rule out. So we'll just lift these up this way, again supporting them here. And I can just look and look, make sure there's no problems with the pads, um, no cuts, lacerations, and no pain on palpation of that. And then we'll right away go to the other side and do that. And we can kind of at the same time do our initial neurological assessment of the front limbs because as I'm looking at the paws and pads, I can then put it down and look at the conscious proprioception function. And you can see, of course, that hers is completely normal. So we can kind of uh, look at both aspects of that particular um, part of the exam as well too. Then I like to look at muscle symmetry next. So I'm just kind of initially feeling the whole um, front limbs and then I'll isolate on in onto the uh, various muscle groups. So we'll isolate into the spinatus muscles, the brachial muscles, and the anabrachial muscles. Again, always looking at symmetry. So if the spinatus muscles here are atrophied, if we can really feel the spine of the scapula and these muscle bellies are not normal, then that's going to indicate a shoulder problem. If it's preferential brachial muscle atrophy, that would indicate an elbow problem. And anabrachial muscle atrophy would be lower on down in the limb. And again, always comparing that symmetry. That's the biggest thing because what's normal for Cala may not be normal for another dog. So we can look at right versus left and see if there's any problems there. And she's great, she's so well muscled. Her body condition is awesome. You're doing a great job on that for sure. So then next I like to look at pain and range of motion. In the front limbs, we look at flexion. Flexion is gonna be the best indicator of pain. And so we'll just work our way up, again, supporting them here. So we'll look at flexion in the carpus. No reaction, Cal is fine with all that. Then we can isolate the elbow, look at flexion in the elbow. And again, no pain or resistance to that and then isolate the shoulder and look at flexion in the shoulder. And then obviously again repeat that right away in the left limb. So flexion in the carpus, flexion in the elbow, and flexion in the shoulder. And no problems there. 
Then particularly for the elbow, we want to look at joint effusions. That would be any swelling um, in the elbows. So we're going to look at lateral epicondyle to olecranon. And we're going to make sure that there's only muscle and bone here in that spot. That's the easiest place to see joint effusion in the elbow and the first indicator of a problem. So we can palpate there really readily in any type of dog and we don't feel any little swelling, water balloon fibrosis. I can easily feel the ankeneus muscle and the bone. And then same thing on the left. So we're just coming from lateral epicondyle to lecranon. So just feeling in here that there's no swelling, no effusion, no fibrosis. Then next we want to look at the medial side. So elbow dysplasia is in the medial compartment of the dog. So we're kind of coming in here and we'll come down and feel the medial epicondyle. So my thumb is here, medial epicondyle to joint line. And then right below the medial epicondyle, we'll just push in there. So if she had dysplasia, it'd be fragment in there and she'd have pain on the medial side. And you can really see that that, even though you're not seeing any problems, an early indicator could just be pain in this compartment. So we're gonna, you know, really um, pointedly uh, palpate that area. And you can see she doesn't, she doesn't care at all, not reacting to that, which is a great sign. And so I'm really just pushing in that compartment and making sure that there's no sensitivity, no problems. Same thing on the left here. So just palpating right in that space, right at the joint line, and no indications of concerns. And then lastly, we're going to look at the biceps. That's the other uh, common area that we'd want to find. And so we can palpate the biceps coming from the shoulder, the medial side, all the way down to the medial side of the elbow. And at first, I just palpate along the musculature with my fingers here. And again, just on palpation, no problems at all, no sensitivity. And then we'll kind of stress it further and flex the limb up and palpate the same way. And no problems at all there. So we'll just palpate along the muscle belly all the way along to make sure no sensitivity. And then do that same thing with flexion. And this is also termed the biceps tendon test, which is a really good one um, for distinguishing shoulder problems from elbow problems in the biceps specifically. Um, so again, then I just kind of will look over the limb again, especially after the exam. Sometimes we'll see a little bit more sensitivity to that. Also do a little bit of weight shifting. So we just get her square, kind of make sure that, you know, she um, knows where her limbs are really well. So again, the neurological component of that and that she's kind of symmetrical in that component of it, which she looks great. And that's it. So we'll go do a gait exam. We'll kind of watch her walk and try. That'll give me a little bit more idea of the functional aspects of it. But everything definitely checks out good right now. And then we'll just make sure that we don't see any concerns there. <laughs> so I think the gait exam is a really critical part of the overall assessment of the dog, especially if we're looking for subtle elbow problems or other forelimb problems. So I really like to watch the dog, get them out in a space, a little more natural space where they can walk and trot. And I'll look at them going away from me, towards me, and then actually each side to make sure that we're not finding any early signs or subtle problems. So Dustin, I'm just gonna have you walk Calip. Uh, hopefully you can just walk her pretty much straight away from me, straight back to me, and then we'll do the same thing with a trot, and then we should be good. So I'll just kneel down to get on the dog's level. And I'm looking for uh, several different things. So stride length, stride duration, how long the, the paw is on the ground, and that the paw is kind of symmetrical. So going away, we can look at more of the hind limbs. And now as we see Kala come towards us, and you can just see she's kind of uh, tracking. Yeah, that's beautiful right there. So we can see she's tracking normally real symmetrical on both limbs and not shifting or mile tracking in any way and her stance time on each footfall is really symmetrical and really normal. So now we just do the trot, that's perfect. Yeah, that's great. And same thing coming toward us, we'll look for head bob, we'll look for any asymmetry that's going on. And especially if we see any subtle asymmetry, then we'll especially look from side to side. That's perfect, thanks guys. That's perfect, good job, Kala, you're awesome. So once we've done the complete physical and orthopedic examination as we've shown, and the gait examination so we can pick up any subtle signs of that. Then we progress on to our diagnostics. And really, x-rays are going to be our hallmark of diagnosis. And the three mandatory views that we really want to look at are, as shown here, the cranial caudal view, the extended medial lateral view, and the flexed medial lateral view. 
I think it's really important to highlight here that OFA only requests this flexed medial lateral view. And that's fine because that's just a screening test for them. What we're interested though in is diagnosing the individual patient. And so we need to get these three mandatory views. Again, we really want to start to diagnose these early in progression, and so we're not going to see fulminant fragments. We're not going to see severe osteoarthritis if we're doing our jobs well, if we're really diagnosing this early. So the subtle things that I want you to look at are particularly in this area here. So this is what we call subtrochlear sclerosis. So the trochlea of the ulna in this area here. And this is really the first and most subtle sign of elbow dysplasia. This is from early bone remodeling because of the problems in the elbow, fragmentation and micro incongruity that leads to this sclerosis in the bone. So focus in on this area. This is a really good example of early mild elbow dysplasia in this patient where the rest of the trochlear notch here on this view and on the flex view, you can see it highlighted even more. This area of sclerosis, this white zone here, should not be present in a normal dog. It should just be a thin white line of normal subchondral bone that's very symmetrical and not asymmetrical and, and kind of irregular along here and definitely not this dense in terms of sclerosis. So this area is where it starts first, subtrochlear sclerosis, and that's our first most subtle sign. The second then is on this flex view, and that's the early osteophytes on this dorsal anconeal ridge. So we really want to look at that area and say, is there any irregularity here? Again, this should be a very smooth, very well-defined border without any irregularity. Then some of the less subtle things that we want to look for are fragmentation in this area. So we may see frank fragments that are obvious here or in the area of the medial coronoid shown here. And then we also may see osteophytes on the radial head. But th those are much more uh, long-term findings indicating more severity or progression. And if we're diagnosing them all at that stage and we're really not helping the client and we're really not doing our best job of early diagnosis so that all the options that we're going to talk about in terms of treatment are available and so that the client is best informed to know what can we do, how can we best manage this to accomplish their goals for the patient. So although really right now the evidence is pretty sparse about the optimal management protocols for elbow problems in dogs. And quite frankly, it's pretty controversial. I think if you do look at the good evidence that's available, and then I would put some of my experience in dealing with these on down the line, I think there's a couple things that we would wanna think about. So to me, it's pretty clear that in the young patient, so under a year of age that we diagnose this in, we really wanna consider referring for arthroscopy as soon as possible. Again, that's gonna help us stage this problem and it's gonna give us the best chance at early treatment that might really slow down the progression of the arthritis and give us a much more manageable patient long-term, especially for our higher activity, high-level uh, pet performance, and certainly the performance of our working dog. It's gonna be really critical to do that right away. And then that's really when uh, you as a general practitioner would come back into play because you're going to have to manage that dog long term. So once we got the full picture arthroscopically in that young patient, you know, then we're going to talk about all the factors that we know non-surgically will help long term. So weight management and body condition, certainly medications when they become necessary. Some of the nutraceuticals can certainly help in that point. And then later on down the line, um, we may definitely need to think about intraarticular injections. So some of the platelet-rich plasma products like ACP are very helpful in terms of minimizing the need for medications so that we reduce the side effects and costs associated with that. And it's also a direct effect so that we're treating the joint and not just treating systemically. So that's usually my next step in the process in when the non-surgical management may not be letting the dog do everything it wants to do is to consider the joint injections at that point. If that becomes uh, no longer effective, then we need to think about the next stage. 
And this is usually the middle aged to older dog and oftentimes again has been managed non-surgically for quite some time or this is a case where we just see the dog at that time point and we're the first intervention in terms of, of surgical management. We really need to restage the dog again. So all the things we talked about today, a good exam, gait exam, x-rays, and then maybe even arthroscopy again to say what's really going on and how affected is the joint. And then we would definitely think about, again, referral for arthroscopy potentially again, or if it's to the point where arth arthroscopic treatment will not be helpful, and again, the medical management has failed, then we really feel good about the canine unicompartmental elbow arthroplasty or Q system that can resurface just the medial component. So I think this is a new thing that's been very helpful because most of the dogs, when we talk to veterinarians uh, around the country, most of the problems they have are not what we've talked about already. It's when you get to this stage. You've tried the NSAIDs, you've tried the gabapentin, you've tried the tramadol, maybe even tried the joint injections, and that's not cutting it anymore. Client's frustrated, you're frustrated. Well, now we do feel like we have a great option in those. Certainly arthrodesis and the other total elbow replacement systems haven't been great for that, but we do feel like Q is a very safe and effective option for the patient we've just described that can really give them a full function. So once you've made that diagnosis, you've talked to the client about that, um, we do think then you can talk to your surgeon uh, that you refer to and discuss this option as a really potential great next step for these patients that are at this point.